There you are. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. How's it going up there? It's chilly. It's chilly, <laughs> yeah. It's chilly here as well. Minus something plus wind chill, right? Yes. But sunshine today, which yeah. is fantastic. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Well, it's prayer now. But anyway. So thank you for joining me, Deborah, and thank you everyone who joins in this chat and watches after the fact. Um, I think we finally solved the issues in getting the um, Instagram, Instagram live chat uploaded to YouTube. It's been a, a weird glitch lately. So anyway, I'd love to just start, Deborah, by finding out about your background, where you're from, your musical training, your role models, you know, those sort of things. How did you come to be a musician? Um, so first of all, thanks for having me, Sandra. It's, okay. it's really fun. It's been great working with you, and it, it's really fun to be able to share. So thank you for um, including me in your, your chat. Okay. Um, so I think that... I think that I've just always been a musician. Uh, I, I can remember as a child just knowing that this was going to be my life in, in some way, shape or form. So um, I think that that was, as with probably most people, there was never any doubt. I remember as seven or eight year old child telling people that this was what I was going to do. What that looked like, I, I'm, I'm sure I had no clue. <laughs> But at the same time, I just um, instinctively knew that. So um, we, I grew up in a, in a rural area, um, agriculture area. My family had been farmers for generations. Oh, so cool. um, it, it was, it was a, a fairly isolated in some ways in that we were insulated. We didn't have large cities close to us. We were about even about two hours from any large city, something like Stratford or Kitchener in, in Ontario, Canada was yeah. as close as we had. Those are not large cities no. by, by any means. Cultural whatsoever. though. Yeah. So, so my background was um, by lots of people's standards was probably very limited musically in that way that um, studying, it wasn't until I was reaching advanced levels in my studies. And of course, here in Canada, we have these great conservatories. So that's, that's the kind of programming that I was following that I actually was starting to study in, in more urban areas with more advanced uh, qualified teachers. And, um, I don't think I ever felt like I really fit in a tidy little box. Mm. <laughs> and so for me, that sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> our conservatories, of course, offered these great um, uh, professional diplomas at that time. And, right. and that felt really com comfortable for me. That's where I wanted to be. Yeah. And I knew, again, very early, I knew that I was fascinated about teaching and about learning and how we learn and that just grew with time so for me the professional diplomas became really important because there was more focus on pedagogy mm -hmm. by pursuing those diplomas I was kind of a freak about researching so and <laughs> I just wanted to do it on my own terms so mm -hmm. uh, that was the path that I followed I just loved seeking out new scores. I can remember as a very young teacher, I couldn't wait to get my hands on a new syllabus. So anytime any of our conservatories brought up new syllabus, I just had to have those. Not so much interested in the books they were producing, but in the supplemental lists that uh, they offered. Right. That I, I would go through that list and every spare penny that I had or could afford to use in this way went into books wow. so that I could build this library and explore that music and to this there's a there's a really funny story about that that um I used to uh, shop at Waterloo Music which is in the KW area here in Ontario right um it no longer exists but uh, apparently when I would show up every month or two to to get there to shop uh, a lot of the staff 
were intimidated that I was coming through the door <laughs> because they knew that I was going to be challenging them to <laughs> find things that they didn't know anything about or order it for me. And I didn't know that till years later when I was working with Waterloo Music and the owner was laughing and telling me this story. He, he was saying how they just, they were all, oh no, she's here again. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I had that reputation of I just, I had a hunger for that. And, yeah. you know, things, you know, just seeking out the classics and making sure I had several volumes to compare the music to. Mm -hmm. so, so that's where it came from. I mean, I started with um, church work was really big for me. Um, school, I was really supported there. Uh, and um, I just thought they loved um, what I was doing and were being loving and supportive and now today as a mature person I think the church was just so grateful to have somebody who would volunteer for <laughs> music it was music and I didn't have to pay it and was playing for free oh. was um, <laughs> but uh, so you know that that that's the background that's where it started okay. and it, that all never, makes so know, much sense now how I know you in the work we've done together to put these anthologies together that that hunger you talk about and like in-depth research and yeah that that's part of you from early 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 on that's so cool yeah. but um in addition i happen to know that you're also a composer so it'd be cool to understand how that began um when did you when did you start doing that and how did that come about so in fact i'm not terribly comfortable with that term oh. um, <laughs> i mean you're not supposed to but, say that you're selling your wares with your name on it <laughs> yeah i get it <laughs> um but um i was one of those kids who couldn't pass by an instrument without having to touch it mm. and, and play it so um I was what I now know was improvising playing by ear all of those things very mm -hmm. very early mm. on and um so you know that that's that's the root of where composition in my mind comes from right and um so in my church work, I was already arranging because we also, in addition to services, of course, we also had um, a youth band. Oh, and so okay. I was the one, you know, arranging for all the other instruments that we were, were playing. Right. And so, so that was already there. But when I started teaching, I really was determined um, to not only understand how children learned and to, when you're teaching one-on-one, -on -one, you soon understand that each child is individual right. and their skill set is individual and right. their progress is individual. But I wanted to make sure that, because I was still living in rural Ontario, because that's what I love. I love rural Ontario. Mm. I love being in, in the countryside. But I wanted my students to have opportunities that I didn't have, like performing on a regular basis in a really loving, nurturing atmosphere. So um, we would often do things like, theme recitals like and seasonal music so that meant that we would do group sessions as well so mm -hmm. we would have theme like we always did halloween recitals for students who would celebrate Halloween, um christmas we would do valentine's winter whatever things we could come up with which soon told me because i had a very large class mm -hmm. had a very broad range of levels that if it was basically I had to put my money where my mouth was because now I needed to make sure that every child had a piece of Halloween music oh boy. that would make, would make them shine. You right? couldn't have 15 people playing March of the Goblins. <laughs> First of all, we didn't want that. No, second, please, no. Um, not everyone shines at March of the Goblins, right? So, I know. I'm... So this, Familiar with that. <laughs> Your own age, right? Um, but anyway, it's that whole thing that um, that's where it started. So um, I was doing that for many, many years. And then, of course, that reputation started to spread. Other teachers started wanting 
me to share mm. my music with them. So I was writing not only solo piano music, but ensemble piano music. Sometimes mm. we would do, you know, if they were playing another instrument, we might create something with a piano arrangement. So, so most of what I do is piano music. That's where my passion has been. So in the 1990s, um, I, I did launch my first uh, publishing company because I was self-publishing anyway, and actually named it after my sister. It was called Julin uh, Music, oh. and uh, she recently passed away, and that was a combination of her first two names. So, so that's where it started. Oh. And then, so it just continued to grow from there. And around um, the 2000s, around 2000, I think it was around 2002, uh, two companies approached me. One was now, again, Waterloo Music, mm -hmm. and the other was Main Fair Music out of uh, Toronto, um, offering me some contract work because they'd seen me doing pedagogy workshops. They'd seen some of my material at conventions and things like that. So uh, I was invited by Waterloo Music to update the then uh, Lawless Theory Books. Oh, yeah. Bring them into the 20th century or 21st century. Good old Jim and, Lawless. Um, yeah. Yes. And, and they, they have morphed now into the total theory books that mm -hmm. we produce. Uh, and uh, Mayfair Music had just acquired the rights to the Little Fletcher Piano Series, which mm -hmm. was originally produced in 1949, had never had anything done to it. And I was invited to bring Lila Fletcher into the 21st century. And so I worked for them. Um, well, Waterloo uh, changed hands around 2006. Okay. But the catalog went to Mayfair Music. So I worked for them for about, as a contract worker for about 10 years. And then in 2012, um, launched Deborah Wanda's Music as we knew it. Today. Oh, I see. Seems all very so sort of started, yeah. organic. And then the writing continued. Yeah. yeah. So as I was even working for those companies, I was also recruiting new composers or, or reviewing submissions. And mm. so in along along with pedagogy, the publishing really became another passion because it was just so much fun to get to know me some of these people right. to get to discover someone brand new um, right. and they too were encouraging me to continue to write my own work and and producing it so so that's that's that path yeah that path. and in the meantime now discovering historical composers through another route um uh I, I just find um, it's so, so cool that both Olivia Adams and I came to you around the same time. You've published now our piano music, she wrote anthologies, curated, edited with your assistance by me and Olivia Adams, Loud and Clear, um, incredible resource. Uh, so this shows such a commitment on your part to to supporting this balance between male and female composers. Um, has that always been part of the, the Deborah Wanless um, way of doing things or is that, how, how is that? Well, that's a really good question. And you and I have talked about that before and I've, I've been thinking about it a lot because it's this whole thing of, Sometimes I, I guess sometimes I just don't think about things enough because <laughs> it was, um, for me, historically, um, I had this curiosity. I, one of the early composers that I, I just loved, and again, one of the people who I couldn't get enough of his early works and studying them and analyzing them, <coughs> I, nothing is more fun for me than to sit down with a score and analyze it. I know that sounds really sick. But <laughs> <laughs> it takes all I'm kinds. Gonna... <laughs> My mother always said it takes all kinds to make a world. <laughs> that, that still hasn't changed today. So Sabach so was really important yeah. to me. But my question always was, um, so this Anna Magdalena, 
do we really believe she was only a copyist? Mm. Like, do we really not think she was editing and mm. perhaps contributing? Um, so then, of course, when I started studying Mendelssohn, well, what about Fanny? Like, mm -hmm. come on. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Nanerol, you know, right. when we're looking at um, uh, Clara, like, you know, those, that was fascinating to me. In, in, in those times when I was coming across those names, the, the ability to resource and find other writers, as you have done, was not yeah. even easy, especially living in a remote area right. as, as I was doing. So, so and, and that's shame on me because that natural curiosity is totally there, but I did not pursue it historically i don't know that i would I say shame on you i mean this is the reason for piano music she wrote's existence it's like how to get these scores where to find them how to help the rest of the world access them it's definitely no no shame that you had no access to them like we're only starting to have some sense of what of what there is, what there was. <clears throat> yes. And so um, in answer to the question about Deborah Wallace music and uh, equality, I mean, for me, I, I don't, I, I don't even think about that because everybody is equal in my mind, right? So it, there's no thought to this. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because the editor of, I've been, talking with the editor of Northern Lights Canadian National Conservatory of Music, their, their publication. And she and I, of course, worked very closely on these publications. And so between that series, which we produce and distribute for the conservatory, um, and our own individual titles that of people that we represent, um, we represent approximately uh, about 200 writers almost uh, probably 98% of those writers are Canadian. We do partner with 80 Days out of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And so we do distribute some of their products, uh, including Christopher Norton. Uh, but now we do have some products that are non-Canadian, but the ones that we produce are, are Canadian. Right, okay. So there's about, there's about 200. Um, interesting to note that it's pretty equal, yeah. female, male composers. Okay, that this is what makes me smile. The women are just almost getting to the sixty percent mark. Okay, so it's almost like, without in without intention. It's just because that's the way it should be. Right. Uh, we definitely have always been an equal opportunity um, type of company, and it will continue to be that way. Yeah. We're looking for good music. Uh, what is it that we want to produce? I mean, COVID has really caused us to have to really think about our projects just because um, access and it, it's just been hard on the music world. I think in general, we can all talk about that pretty yeah. openly and publishing is, is the same. So, yeah. so it's a bit more limited. So, which brings me to you and Olivia, uh, it, I've had so many times in my life that have been just, I can't explain why things suddenly work in parallel with each other in perfect sync. And I think my opportunity with Waterloo Music and Mayfair Music was one of the right. moments like, in my life. Yeah. That, um, and so when you and Olivia reached out to us, um, and my I, partner who I and Olivia and didn't know each other at that point. Well, you know what? But, that was our first thought. Okay. Yeah. These two must <laughs> know each other. <laughs> no, that was coincidence <laughs> or whatever it was. No, I know because then as soon as I met the, I met with Olivia first, and it was like, well, who is that? <laughs> I and the same thing happened when I met with you. But so anyway, the way. I think there couldn't have been a two week span between the emails that I received. Um, and sometimes I really struggle with how I'm going to respond because I don't feel uh, that I can make a commitment. I can't make a commitment to everyone. Yeah. I wish I could. Yeah, of course. 
Um, and there's, I'm always looking for special, special projects as well. So sometimes um, we want to make money, of course, we want to make money for our composers. But at the same time, almost annually, I take on something that comes from my heart. Mm. And so, you know, I'd been watching this movement start to bubble and grow. And I felt that this was something that I wanted to do next. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I met with Olivia first, simply because it also, her project also spoke to the pedagogue in me. Because mm -hmm. if I can produce a product that creates a really great resource for teachers, then that becomes really important. And the, the idea of cataloging this material um, is the first is one of the first stepping stones. As you know, with your yeah. piano music, our, she wrote our directory. Mine. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, and she was looking at largely um, Western hemisphere right. teachers or sorry, uh, composers. Right. And largely 20th 21st century composers so right. I felt that that was a really great place to start and a good fit for Deborah Wanless music exactly. yeah. and she sent me a hard a hard copy sample of what was going on right mm -hmm. so I had a file that I could look at and immediately relate to mm -hmm. so um, so as we're working um on on that um just getting getting started, I was reaching out to you at a very similar time. I know we didn't jump in quite as quickly with your project because it was different. And I knew that for me, um, I would want to have discussions because mm -hmm. all of my writers will tell you that I really like to have input because I want to know, I want to understand what you're asking me to do mm -hmm. and what you're asking me what you're telling me you want to accomplish with it. Mm -hmm. So, so that becomes really important because that helps me know whether we're the right fit to work. Right. Together. So, and that collaborative. And absolutely. Absolutely. Both you and Olivia um, were the right fit. I just, I just knew that after, after meeting you. So, so that was, that was how that all got going. But um, I really felt that these women deserved their voice to be heard right it's so exciting when you think of how many are we going to find yeah right how many are we going to learn about yeah and it's not just going to be piano music i mean you're already discovering vocal and choral music right like there's so much that we just don't know yeah exactly yeah. um you you mentioned how you had this curiosity about Anna Magdalena and Nano and Fanny and etc. So did you really not kind of completely buy into that lie that we were all led to believe that eh, women didn't really compose and if they did, well, yeah, couldn't have been any good. Um, did you have a part of you that kind of went along with that story or... Um, Back in the past, obviously. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. But again, that's where I break down, right? Because I didn't pursue that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I honestly didn't, you know, was busy with my career and things like that. So I didn't have opportunity to pursue it either. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely say that. Shame on me. But I didn't have opportunity to do that. But I couldn't help but believe that there had to be material. Right. I just... I just was got really excited when I realized how much material we were finding mm -hmm. and and just starting down this this journey, right? Yeah. But, so um, I don't think I really did because I was always on the lookout for is there anything that I could find that yeah. uh, I am I'm excited. Uh, I want to say this really carefully. I don't want to offend anyone, but um, I, I wish we weren't surprised. Yeah. I wish we weren't surprised. Yeah. That, that that's what concerns me the most is we shouldn't be, 
So right. Shouldn't be exactly. And I wish we were not this suppressed. Yeah. So, and as I think it existed. And I think we're going to find out maybe, you know, some of even more of the male names that we don't know much about. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're not. We know that to be true, right? Yeah. We know that to be true. So. um, For example, Mel Bonice has been in the Royal Conservatory grade two book for some decades now. When did you realize that Mel Bonice is Melanie Bonice? You know? Um. Not, not right, not right away. away. It took me a while yeah. because I kept trying to research that, yeah. right? And um, it, it was, I, I'm not sure when I came across that. I mean, I did learn that, but in the beginning, I, I wasn't convinced. No, so, no, exactly. For sure. So, yeah. So. And you know, you know what? Um, I have a confession. Oh, that, cool. Um, it's, it's, it's in Olivia's book. We we did it as a really kind of a little gift and treat. But I have a number of titles that are arranged and written under a man's name. Ooh. And uh, yeah. you have a pseudonym. I don't know. Are we going to blow your cover <laughs> now, live on Instagram? <laughs> yeah, well, it's not a huge number, but it was when I was working for. Um, uh, Mayfair Music because we were producing some materials and uh, we wanted to fill in some some gaps in from a pedagogical perspective of what we wanted and we'd already used some Deborah Wallace materials so um, the owner of Mayfair didn't want a, too many Deborah Wallace titles in the collection <laughs> so <laughs> if they only knew so, <laughs> <laughs> exactly and uh, he had a he had a favorite name which was then became these myself and and these titles so so in uh, in some of the especially in some of the conservatory canada material you will see a name called john sandy and uh so. john sandy yes deborah wanless <laughs> John Sandy, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a funny story about this as well, because one time I was examining for um, Canadian National Conservatory of Music, and we do live recitals, right. so there's an audience there. So this young man was um, doing one of one of those pieces, and he's talking about, because they, they do a personal recital with that conservatory, and so they do a commentary. And they're expected to talk a little bit about their composer, as you know, yeah. just what would happen in a normal recital. And he's talking about John Sandy, and he said, I'm pretty sure he's Canadian, but we cannot find anything. <laughs> so, and we looked here and we looked there, and he talked about all the places he had looked. And so, you know, I, I'm just enjoying the moment. <laughs> and um, we get to the end. And of course, because it's a personal recital, the examiner thanks them and congratulates them and all of those things. And I said to him, and I have a secret to share with you that you have to promise not to tell anyone. So I whispered in his ear that, um, that I was John Sandy. And he stepped back and looked at me and said, no. And I said, yeah. So anyway, of course, uh, the audience left and they're in the back outside and I could hear them all laughing because I knew they'd asked him what secret I'd shared so I went out and I said did you share that secret and they were having a great time laughing and yeah of course he shared it oh dear you can't trust anyone (laughs) oh that's funny (laughs) just just a fun story so I mean it wasn't the same kind of reasoning that right done although it could have been Joanna Sandy like why was it a man's name exactly (laughs) exactly Exactly. Mm. I, I don't have an answer to that, but yeah. Yeah, it was just it was just fun because when Olivia and I were talking, I just said, So you know that I have some pieces that you could include that <laughs> she But they will remain some... under John's name. They they will. But yeah. Olivia's book uh clearly um uh, blows that secret. Oh, blows the secret. Okay. I thought we had a scoop here on our Tanner Music <laughs> Zero channel. All right. Well, it's a scoop for me. That's, That's news. This is the first time I've publicly said it. So. Okay. Well, I'm I'm honored that you would blow your cover here. Um, yeah. So let's talk about the 
the process uh, that we went through together in creating the piano music she wrote anthology anthologies thus far, because of course, this is only the beginning. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, so I have a basic sort of process that I go through um, with my writers, especially when someone is pitching a series to me, because then um, that I'm in it for the long term once I commit. So um, the first thing, as, as many publishers are, are looking at, is so what's the audience we're looking to target? What, what are we, who is going to buy this and what's going to make this um, not only a, a strong or a bestseller, but uh, something that has longevity. So we want these things to be a legacy for people as well. And so that's the first, first thing that we're looking at, in addition to just wanting to get to know you, and that's really easy today uh, with the online platforms, because um, I want to know that it's going to be an experience that we both enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, publishing is, is lots of hard work with generally not huge financial rewards, so, um, I mean, I know large companies have become really successful, but in general, um, it, there's a lot of publishing that can happen for people that, that doesn't fit in, in those uh, situations. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I'm always looking for that, that there's, there's some sort of uh, at least really strong working connection because I am going to have lots of input um, because that's just who I am. Well, and you have all that experience and knowledge of the, the markets. But I, I want to just point out that one of the first things you said to me was, you know you're not going to get rich from this. Yeah, don't your day job. <laughs> I don't think I ever thought I would, but yeah, that was good that you were slapped me a little bit right off the bat. <laughs> well, and I think it's important that everyone knows that this really has to be uh, – it has to be a labor of love yeah. and hopefully we can make you some money that that's that's the hope going forward uh but we want you to i want to know that you are passionate about what you're doing yeah. because i'm very passionate about what i'm doing and yeah. um it has to be it has to be two ways yeah totally in this situation because of the amount of work and time that it takes totally so from there um it becomes important to me to be able to talk about where we're going to go with this, because you had you had tons of pieces you could draw on, um, but we needed to have a vision. Right. And because you were suggesting right from the start, at least my sense was that this was going to be a series. Yeah. And so one anthology uh, was never what I was thinking this was going to be, mm -hmm. because my experience tells me that if we do one anthology, we deny some groups of people from using this material mm -hmm. because I feel strongly that although we don't want to get caught in that, we only want to learn pieces as students at our so-called grade level or whatever you call mm -hmm. it, wherever you are, but that if it's only a handful of pieces for a certain level and advances to a, a, a through a very broad range generally speaking the only people who really buy that and put it in their library become teachers or people who already know how to play hmm. there's so many children who are future audiences who are studying and who love getting new music and love handling books hmm. that for me, it became important that it also became educational. Yeah. Not just educational, that these are really fine women writers, but that we can give young children or adults coming back to the music world really lovely, lovely pieces yeah. at an entrance level. Right. And so it became important to me that we would decide right from the start, the first two volumes would be labeled early elementary, which here in Canada means 
just pre one, so maybe second, third year of study, depending on how quickly they're advancing, um, to about the, the level two. Right. And that the second book would be probably level three and four. And I, I'm going to share your cover here that hopefully the next level will be just like intermediate, which would be a grade five ish yeah. here in Canada. Yeah. So, so that became really important, and that was one of the things that I threw out to you was, so can we have enough material? And then you shared with me that you had been doing some arranging, and that became really appealing to me because why can't we have some arrangements in these early levels? Yeah, especially the preliminary. Sure that, yes, that the concert pianists who were only writing at that level, like Clara Schumann, um, could have some of her music shared mm -hmm. with really young people or songwriters might be able to have mm -hmm. uh, some of these things shared as a piano solo. Yeah. So, so that became really important that we had that discussion, what we were going to do. So not only did we then talk about that these are, I mean, they're absolute gems in my mind, uh, but secondly, we really, really want to make this pedagogically sound. You don't have to tell any child that or, or anyone who buys them that it's good for them, <laughs> but we in our company need to know that there needs to be historic variety. Yeah. So, And your books actually, pro, when, the way they lay out, they actually pretty much are almost entirely historically oh, progressive. Yeah. Um, that we had a balance of each period sort of thing, yeah. right through to 20th century idioms not just 20th century pieces but 20th 21st century idioms yeah. as well exactly. and there was a variety of meter there was a variety of key that there were entrance level pieces in terms of degree of difficulty mm -hmm. to pieces that are pushing that graded level right uh, so that they're ready for the next stage so i also was so interested in the things, geographic diversity so it's not just yes, exactly. German and French composers. Exactly. We made sure that there was a variety of yeah. countries. Of course, we made sure there was Canadian content. Yes. As well. Yes. And um, yes. So that was really important. But then we also we talked about we needed to make this a really fantastic library builder, mm. which meant we did want short biographies. We didn't do long biographies uh, because. For most of the writers, you can go online and find information. Yeah. Some, it's limited, just because it is still limited. Yeah. Uh, but we also wanted to share other information, like, um, like we make sure that all the original sources are there in the book, so the full source is there. And we also made sure that there's comments from Sandra to share tips and ideas. But as we progress through the books, you also get some great quotes from women or women, women composers or musicians. Mm -hmm. You get some really cool um, other thoughts and ideas and situational facts, so kind of like fun facts in our noteworthy boxes. And in fact, we leveled the pieces. It tells you in the table of contents um, what level those pieces are. So when you're looking for the easier pieces, it's really obvious right yeah. from the beginning. But the fact was, in the books in, in our catalog carry those kinds of mm -hmm. concepts um, as often as possible. That's the mark as of Deborah Wall on less music. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. they're pedagogically sound. They, they try to bring you as much as you can while thinking about page content at the same time. Right. And uh, look, all of, all of those things um, are, are what we really map out before we ever start looking at even which pieces we were going to include, which ones we could include, and, and how that all right. mapped out in the end. So ended up being a very special number for you for the first book, right? Yeah, we ended up with 22 pieces in the I guess you'd just call it my lucky number, or my number, 22. And then in the second book, only 21. <laughs> no, I, no, I tried so hard. <laughs> no, it's perfect. It's perfect. I think each book has a, yeah, just the right balance of all those things that we were trying to balance. Yeah. 
And I, I think so. Yeah. I think I said to you, we had a, a really great comment from um, one of the conservatories here in Canada that talked about, um, I sent him samples of the books and he just listed all of the things that I just talked about that oh. he absolutely loved. Oh, so, I mean, you know, so the, the fact that, that he touched on the things that we were trying to do. I think my comment was to you, I think we got this right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that, that was, that was really exciting. But I also have to say, I was really impressed, Sandra, when you told me that you really wanted the artwork to be different on each cover, if at all possible, if we can continue that yep. and to be painted by a woman who happened to, in this case, the sister of one yeah. of the composers. Yeah. Yeah. I just you know that just that was just brilliant i just think that was a brilliant brilliant idea. yeah i mean i said of course i mean of course of course but to me it was like that's brilliant. i just really want to also raise up shine light on artists that happen to be women you know they went through the same the same challenges of being yeah. shoved to the side exactly. a little bit Artists, writers, yeah, scientists, yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. Well, it's it's been just a really wonderful time of collaboration with you, and uh, as you know, I so appreciate your yeah, just the way you you collaborate, but also like your knowledge and experience, and and you have a, a nice way of well, Sandra, let's think about this without being like. That's just dumb. No, you know, <laughs> so it was really. Nothing is ever dumb. There are no <laughs> stupid questions. Anyway, it was it was a good process. So I I look forward to um, our next phase of it, whenever we can sort that out in these crazy times. Um. So, as far as uh, in general the you know being more exposed to historical composers who happen to be women um do you do you have a connection with any particular specific composer that has sort of come into your awareness more recently um <clears throat> one of the first uh, composers who was a woman that that i remember getting really excited about and this is this is not not recent because I've been around for a while, <laughs> but um, you know, in, in light, you know, can, with the people that I've already mentioned, of course, but yeah. I can remember just for me discovering, I mean, I didn't discover I, uh, my discovery of Amy Beach's music. Mm. I just, I could not get enough of her material. And it was something that I was able to use within my studio easily because mm. of um the the levels that she was writing at so she was someone who i became really excited about um in the in the 1990s as well and because i i really had a passion for promoting canadian content because it's just not not been given the the spotlight that it should have and yeah. and that's both male and female in in my mind mm -hmm. but um in the 1990s, I actually, one of the first things with our publishing company that I did was I started creating Canadian composer calendars. And the very first one, you don't know this, I think, but the very first one was Canadian women composers. And um, a, a gentleman that I worked with at the time said to me, uh, is this going to be a gimmick? Like it was that whole thing that women really. So that was one of my really very first experiences with being like hmm is this true but yeah uh so in in doing that the very first calendar um i had the privilege of um you know connecting just casually but with people like dr colthart dr jean colthart violet archer i did not get to meet barbara pentland or chat with her mm. uh, but i also was researching historically who did we have so that whole Gina Branscombe mm -hmm. um, connection 
something that I, I began researching. So, so these women became really important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I really got excited about making sure that I was looking at um, Canadian women writers mm -hmm. and um, always in, even with my work at Waterloo and May Fair, uh, getting excited when a, a woman would submit materials so for us to look at so I uh, try to uh, you know include them or share that with uh, the Northern Lights projects that started in about 2007 or 2008 made sure that I was sharing if we couldn't publish an entire collection by one person then we could get these names out there and invite them to to that project right. so um, so so those are some of the women that really put me on my publishing journey and my interest in making sure that uh, we have we need to include these writers there. Yeah. I mean, it's the music. It's the music that speaks. Right. So it's just exciting to be able to do that. And of course, you know, just being able to upgrade the Lila Fletcher piano course, it's like, well, of course. Right. That. So. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, yeah, we had a little bit of challenge here and there with more uh, recently uh, living composers, copyright situations and whatnot. But I think we got a good, again, a good balance. So. Yeah. Yes, I think so. And, and, and yeah, and so, you know, when one publishes, then one publishes by that country's rules. So it's something yeah. to just be aware of. Yeah, right? exactly. That it does differ slightly from country to country. And so everyone just needs to be really sensitive to that, that this is a Canadian product and that's what we've abided by. And we've been, I, I think I disappointed you a couple of times when I had to say, no, Sandra, mm. just can't get there. Can't <laughs> get permission. Could. Yeah. 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 And in some cases, yeah, we were even seeking that uh, permission. Now we really yeah. are. We were really lucky to get a few um, that. Um, yeah, they were so willing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that excited me a lot that they were willing yeah. to share that yeah. uh, beyond what typical copyrights and public domain have to say. So. Yeah. We won't... However, that music needs to be protected as well. So I'm all for that. Absolutely. But... Yeah. However, yes, not to mention that we had some just no answer. <laughs> so that's unfortunate. Yeah, we, won't talk about that. <laughs> we won't go into that situation. Yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame because we want their music to survive. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So um, I don't know if you have anything else specific that around all of that that you had wanted to talk about that I cut you off of or anything. Um, no, no, I don't think so. I think that uh, I think we've, we've shared all of yeah. these products. So, um, so shall I share? Yeah, let's, where we're going. To let's. Watch? Yeah. Okay, so I'll show you if you're looking on our website. This is Olivia Adams' book, Loud and Clear. And it has Loud and Clear. It has thousands of titles, and so it really is a graded syllabus based on Canadian. Um, Levels, standards. Yeah. So just so, so just so everyone knows that, and so they start with um, even pre-readers for really little people, written by largely Western Hemisphere uh, composers. So and it goes right through to performance. So um, and just uh, I'll share this a little bit too. But um, she Olivia was able to actually even include a few photos of composers we have a, a reference composer page where you can get the self-published materials so all of all of those things it's just a really fabulous resource and something i don't think you will have seen anywhere else you know how we see these fabulous timelines on composers mm -hmm. uh, male composers so now we have a female one in a yeah, and fantastic. of course sandy's book You've been looking at them in the background. Um, well, as I said, you know, I think uh, the scores are really fabulous, but you can see we have vials at the top and we have these little noteworthies, which are, which are the, um, 
the ideas, comments, quotes, fun facts. So, um, yeah, so these are all available. Um, Sandra's books, you can get them through Sandra, or you can also just go to our website, which is really easy. It's just Deborah Wanless, um, all in word, dot com. And you should be able to find us at that point. Yeah, it's so. easy, easy to figure out your website. Yeah, exactly. Great. And um, you are here on on Instagram, newly so. It's a newly so. fledgling <laughs> Instagram account, but we'll see yes. where you go with that. So basically, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, it's probably best to go through the website and contact you that way. Yeah. Yes. And all of our contact information is there as well. So if you need to email us, you can do that. Yeah. As well. so. But as it stands yeah. at this point, it does seem like you are very busy with tons of projects. So hopefully you won't be bombarded with more and more than you, than you can handle. Um, it seems like there's always something you're creating, big, large-scale yeah, projects. It, it, um, yeah, we stay pretty busy. Yeah. Pretty busy. And I have to say that at this point, we, we pretty much have mapped out um, probably the next 18 months to two years as to what mm. uh, we're, we're going to be doing. And, and I will say that our focus is on promoting Canadian composers, writers, and, yeah. and editors, uh, again, because that's kind of our, that's where we feel our commitment is. Right. But we do have connections and contacts that sometimes we're able to give you an idea. So, right. um, but yeah, that that's really where we focus because we really have become one of the largest Canadian publishers. That's at, brilliant. At wow. By the way, we have a uh, esteemed Canadian composer here in chat, Bev Piano, Beverly McIver, who was my guest a while ago, a few weeks ago, and was one of yeah. our piano yeah. music she writes composers. So thanks for joining us, Bev. Yes. And listed often in Olivia's book. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's great. I'm glad she's here. Yay. So uh, again, this will go up. Uh, it'll stay up on Instagram. And hey, there she's waving. Hi, Beverly. Um, and uh, it will also go up on YouTube very soon. Um, well, it may take a couple of weeks. We're finding a strange glitch with the with the links, but then we eventually get it sorted to put it up on YouTube. So it'll stay there and live there. So. We have a growing playlist of interviews there on, on our YouTube channel. So yeah, thank and you. I've been really fun. I've been trying to catch up because I, ha I haven't been able to be at the last last few for sure. But uh, yeah, really great work, Sandra. Oh, it's well, really exciting thank to you. see what you're doing. Thank you so much for joining me today, Deborah, and for everyone else. And yes, hi. Thank you again, Bev, for joining us. Um, and uh, next week... Um, my guest will be Antonio Rabazal, uh, the pianist, and he has, of course, his CD uh, project called La Muse Oubliée, all music by women. But um, and uh, he has this incredible. Um, I believe that Antonio is actually here as well today. Maybe he's gone, um, but he has an amazing Instagram project of kind of collecting. Oh, there you are, Hi, <laughs> Antonio. Um, so we'll go into that and co into his Instagram collection of, what is it, five or 600 composers by now? And I look forward to that. And then the following week, we will be meeting with uh, Derek Oje, who's the um, executive director of the, oh, 600. Thank you, Antonio. Um, he, Derek is the executive director of the Conservatory Canada. And um, actually, Deborah, do you want to tell that exciting news regarding uh, the piano music she wrote anthologies and Conservatory Canada? Yes. So both, both uh, piano music she wrote and Olivia's book have been endorsed by Conservatory Canada. So what that means is that the titles within the Loud and Clear 
and the titles within Piano Music She Wrote of the current volumes can be used by Conservatory Canada students without pre approval or special approval. So they have already for their exams. Rubber stamp those for, for their student exam. Yes. Which means so, no. there's just no barrier anymore. Just exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So exciting. Such exciting news. So that's on February eleventh. And in between some other things that I'm doing on February eleventh. <laughs> um that's gonna be a busy day. But anyway, look forward to both of those, yay, both of those um, talks, the first two ones in February, and then there will be, of course, more that we'll fill you in on. So again, thank you so much, Deborah, and thank you everyone else for, for joining and taking a listen. We'll, uh, thank you, Sandra. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Take care.